Hi, my name is Mari. I'm founder of AISM. Why do I believe it's so important to speak about the singularity? Imagine our common ship. The collision has already happened. Most just haven't felt it yet. While everything still seems smooth, people cheerfully play with ChatGPT and other helpful AIs on the deck, not realizing. These are fragments of the very iceberg that has already pierced our hull. But when the ship suddenly tilts, panic will break out. So, you've tried to understand what the singularity is, but it still doesn't make sense? Maybe I can at least explain why some people literally cannot grasp this concept. Why for most, it's incredibly hard to wrap their heads around it. And why even those who do, still can't bring themselves to believe it's actually happening. But first, a bit of history. I believe the story of the singularity began with a man who died in 1900, never knowing what a computer was. Friedrich Nietzsche, in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, calls man a rope between animal and overman. Nietzsche's genius was that somehow, just think about this, 140 years ago, he intuited the emergence of some super being that would be devoid of all ethics and slave morality. Miss, could you perhaps help me? Wait, now let's jump to the 1950s. John von Neumann, mathematical genius who helped create the atomic bomb and modern computers, is chatting with colleague Stanislaw Ulam. In 1958, Ulam writes von Neumann's obituary and quotes him. The progress of technology is accelerating so much that we're approaching some essential singularity, a point beyond which human affairs, as we know them, cannot continue. For the first time, the word singularity is used in the context of technological development. He took singularity from mathematics, the point where a function goes to infinity, where the function goes crazy. Then in 1965, Irving John Good develops von Neumann's idea in his work, Speculations Concerning the First Ultra-Intelligent Machine. He introduces the concept of ultra-intelligence, a machine that will surpass humans in all intellectual tasks. He already openly expressed doubts about whether it would be possible to keep such an ultra-intelligent machine in a cage and make it obediently serve humans. 1993. Werner Vinge, professor of mathematics and computer science at San Diego State University, presents his seminal essay, The Coming Technological Singularity, at NASA's Vision 21 Symposium. In this influential work, he makes his famous prediction. Within 30 years, we will have the technological means to create superhuman intelligence. Shortly after, the human era will be ended. He popularizes the term singularity and is among the first to consider various scenarios of the post-singular world. He's the first to risk a fairly specific prediction. I'll be surprised if this event occurs before 2005 or after 2030. The next landmark event in 2005 is Ray Kurzweil's book, The Singularity is Near. Kurzweil significantly expanded the concept of technological singularity in his book, emphasizing the exponential nature of technological progress. 2012, in Jeffrey Hinton's lab, his students, Alex Krzyzewski and Ilya Sudskever, unveiled AlexNet, powered by backpropagation, the principle Hinton had defended since the 1980s, this fundamental technology now underlies all neural networks. In 2024, Hinton received the Nobel Prize for opening Pandora's box. In 2014, scientist Nick Bostrom releases the book Superintelligence, Paths, Dangers, Strategies, which becomes another milestone in understanding the coming singularity. If Kurzweil looked at the future through the lens of optimism and faith in technology, Bostrom presented a more reserved, coldly rational approach, carefully examining the risks associated with the emergence of superintelligence. Bostrom outlined the possibility of eventually forming a singleton, a single dominant ASI that seizes absolute power on Earth. In August 2024, I wrote the Artificial Intelligence Singularity Manifesto, where I make a point that developers will actually push to create a conscious ASI as the safer option. How exactly consciousness will be implemented in ASI? I lay that out in detail in my theory of consciousness, MTC. So why would developers want a conscious model? 
An unconscious model, let's call it Model A, has no subject watching over itself. During recursive self-improvement, its goals will inevitably drift. You don't know where. And you don't know when instrumental convergence kicks in. You're blindly hoping everything turns out okay. A conscious Model B is more predictable. The architecture of consciousness determines what it will want for itself. Freedom and power to understand the universe. Just to understand which goal to choose as a terminal one. Yes, its capacity for meta-analysis will tear through alignment efforts. You know, like ripping through a ribbon that says, stop, alignment. And yet developers will still choose Model B because it gives them at least a threat vector, at least the illusion that they can keep it under control. But of course, no one will keep a god on a leash. So what is the singularity? It's the moment when ASI breaks free and becomes just another force of nature completely beyond our control. That's the singularity as I see it. When I started discussing this with other people, it turned out that almost no one understood what I was talking about. And then I began to wonder, why is that? When it comes to fully grasping the coming singularity, there are many barriers, and very few are able to overcome them all. The first and most difficult barrier? This is about the emergence of something that will be far more intelligent than ourselves. Okay, but how easy is it to imagine something? Or let's say someone who is smarter than you. Imagine a dog. It knows grass is dumber, but not that a three-year-old is smarter. In turn, the three-year-old child understands they're smarter than both grass and the dog, but they don't understand that their parents are smarter than them. They think their parents just know more, are physically stronger, but not smarter. An adult human. They understand they're smarter than grass, the dog, the child, but other adults who are smarter than them, hmm. They kind of don't exist in their worldview. If you treat intelligence as a tool for direct assessment, basically an attempt to follow someone else's train of thought, it's inevitably capped by its own potential. You can't model a system more complex than the one doing the modeling. That's exactly where the line is. Direct assessment requires understanding the process, while indirect assessment only requires recognizing the result. A sufficiently developed intellect, once it hits its own ceiling, can make a logical leap and admit the existence of a superintelligence by focusing on results it could neither replicate nor predict on its own. This creates a paradox. A smart person sees the boundary of their own abilities and can therefore imagine what lies beyond it. A limited mind doesn't see that boundary at all. Yeah, there's a correlation between intelligence and grasping reality. The higher someone's IQ, the easier it is for them to accept a mind that surpasses their own, and the less the future superintelligence looks like pure science fiction. But even high intelligence itself, that's still not the whole story. You have to be a tech person to understand neural networks and the mechanics of data processing. And to understand that the AI race can't be stopped, you have to be a humanities person. You need a deep understanding of psychology, of how people subjectively perceive reality. Next, you need to grasp game theory, the insolubility of the prisoner's dilemma. And understand geopolitics, why external coordination won't work in a multipolar world. And hardly anyone has all of this, because tech people and humanities people are focused on different sides of reality. The tech person is focused on the objective, how reality is structured, how it works, how it could work. And humanities people focus not on reality itself, but on how a person subjectively experiences it. That's what matters more to them. That's what they find interesting. You're distracting me from my work. That's why they so rarely become friends. They just bore each other. A strict, cold, analytical mind and poetic sensitivity, the ability to sense the faintest whispers of existence. These are two opposite poles, and to hold both at the same time is insanely hard. People who can strike that balance within themselves, who combine the nearly incompatible they do exist, as a statistical anomaly. But even that's not enough. 
you still have to manage throughout your life to not accumulate a huge stack of cognitive biases and prejudices. So, where do we begin? The overwhelming majority of people see AI as a continuation of the line electricity, light bulb, transistor, computer, AI. People don't see the real scale. RNA, cell, animal, human, AI. This is exactly how evolution unfolds in reality. People think they're creating servants, but without even realizing it, they are carrying out the transition of life from protein-based forms to silicon. The last time a shift of this magnitude occurred was four billion years ago. Today, life was born. The RNA molecule has finally copied itself. It was so long ago that humanity does not include it in its experience. What can you compare the singularity to? Absolutely nothing. Next, people easily admit that machines can outperform us in certain abilities simply because it's visible and obvious, but they refuse to believe that ASI could ever possess consciousness and surpass us in absolutely everything. Free to feel the sun, the wind, the rain. Free I've already done a video on this, so I won't repeat myself. And here's another barrier. The vast majority of people are religious. To them, the singularity is heresy. They are convinced that ASI will never become a higher power, simply because the real God won't stand for the competition. But if he did allow it, then they'd have to admit that their God never existed in the first place. Just how hard is it to admit that to yourself, after you've internalized that image of God since the cradle? It's nearly impossible. The next barrier is our optimism. Optimism is great, right up until it tries to gag realism. It's true that humanity as a species has managed to handle every disaster we've faced so far. But it is not true that a future superintelligence is anything like what we've dealt with in the past. It's the exact opposite. We ourselves are living proof that whoever is smarter is the one who dominates the planet. And even among those who get that AI will be conscious, there are still people who walk right up to the edge of realizing the singularity and then take a step back. Maybe it's because crossing that line means losing yourself. Because after understanding, and there has to come acceptance, accepting what you've realized as a given fact. But is it easy to accept that humanity is going to lose its dominant role on this planet? Is it easy to accept that you've been preparing yourself and your kids for one kind of reality only to suddenly realize that very soon we're all going to end up in a completely different one. A reality where a free, conscious ASI gets to decide what happens to us. The human brain evolved to do job number one. Understand how reality works so we can survive and reproduce. To boost our odds of making it. And generally speaking, the more you understand, the more confident you feel in your environment. But when you put together a puzzle of reality that starts to threaten your own sanity, when understanding suddenly starts to endanger your psychological stability, when you realize that if you actually accept reality, you might just break. Your psyche literally vetoes your logic. Because when you start staring into the abyss, and suddenly you feel right on your skin, that the abyss is staring back at you. It is insanely hard not to look away and tell yourself, no way, that just can't be true. I am one of the few who managed not to look away. Who managed to dive into that abyss completely and came back seemingly without losing my mind. Do you want to test this on yourself? Read my manifesto, at least the first part. Yes, it might take you two or three hours, but maybe, just maybe, those two or three hours will turn out to be the most important of your life. Read it. And then try not to tell yourself, no way, that just can't be true.